Thomas, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to uh, be spending this time with you. We're going to talk about your new book, The Coming Christian Persecution. Uh, and it's it's really fascinating because it's not only what's to come, but also uh, the, the history of persecution in the church and the lessons that we can draw from uh, our, our forebears as well as what's going on around the world. So um, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to unpacking this with you today. I am too, Paul. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's, I think, a very important topic, obviously, and something that hopefully we'll be able to flesh out pretty well here. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I really enjoyed the book. Uh, if enjoyed is, you know, the right word, of course. And um, I do appreciate you, you, you know, you take a lot of pains to um, help readers, I think, particularly in the West, understand persecution that's going on in other parts of the world, um, particularly like Asia and Africa, where Western media, I don't think, tends to pick up um, those stories. And also, when I think about the, the kinds of Catholic media that I see, you know, predominantly here in the West, you know, there's a, a lot of the, it's the political, you know, where's Pope Francis stand on this or that and what's going on with the Latin mass and a lot of things, but there's a real severe persecution going on in like places like Nigeria or, um, you know, throughout Asia where there's a large Christian presence and yet people are, are being, you know, tormented and imprisoned and, and whatnot. So I think it puts a lot of things in perspective, uh, you know, for... Well, yeah, I mean, this is something that, as you know, I mean, this is something Christians experienced from the very first centuries, beginning with the life of Jesus himself. And it's not surprising that it would continue to our own day. But I think that the numbers are are, are somewhat shocking, honestly, when you look at just the, the the radical, I mean, how widespread it is and how serious it is. And as you say, something that that the media, for whatever reasons, whatever motives, uh, choose not to talk about. So many people of goodwill are simply ignorant to the fact of how much our brothers and sisters are suffering around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think maybe some of it I, I might presume is this this idea of like, you know, this poor benighted, you know, uh, non-Westerners, you know, with their antiquated beliefs in this Christian God, you know, it's not really worth covering in our, our media, you know, it doesn't fit our narrative, but that's just me. Uh, maybe that's just me. But let me well, add I think that's actually, actually maybe a, a kinder read on it that I would tend to give. I think there might at times be something even a little bit more insidious than that, which is that I think in the West right now, Christians are often looked upon as obstacles to progress in, in the understanding of progress that radical secularists would like to see. Mm -hmm. So when Christians who take their faith seriously stand up for things like traditional marriage or, or the, the right to life of the unborn, these are seen as, as problematic. So I think that, you know, if you were to report on how much Christians are suffering around the world, make them into martyrs, if you will, which they really are, uh, but you would be in a way encouraging and, and supporting in some way these Christians on their own home turf that they're look at, looking upon as the enemy, someone who, who they don't want to give Christians any benefit of the doubt. They don't want to give Christians in, in anybody feeling sorry for them or saying, yeah, Christians deserve better support. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. You know, and you spurred a couple of thoughts there. Uh, you know, one is that, you know, the, the concept, and you write about it in the book about Nero, that, you know, the, the, the severity of his cruelty against Christians actually... I, I believe like worked against him where it actually inculcated like sympathy among the Romans for these Christian people that they were willing to like suffer these horrendous deaths uh, to satiate this, you know, cruel tyrant. And, and, you know, it, like that old saying goes that the blood of Christians is this or the, the blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians. But also um, I, you know, it seems like in the West, we're starting to see more and more, the rhetoric is turning a bit more violent uh, or um, against Christians, because, you know, we kind of get in the way of a good time, so to speak, you know, about progress and, you know, libertinism and how people want to want to live their lives, regardless of how we're designed and created. And so we were starting to see this kind of violent rhetoric ratchet up to where it's almost like a, like a, you know, um, uh, like an inquisition, like a, a liberal inquisition, like it, it's okay to persecute Christians because 
they, like you said, they get in the way of progress. And, you know, who, who would stand in the way of progress except, you know, some caveman that must be eradicated or something like that. So that, that, that is so true. You know, honestly, as bad as persecution is around the world, and in some place it is, is truly horrendous. And we'll have a chance to talk about this if you go around. But honestly, I am more concerned in a very serious way about the West, because if we lose a support for uh, religious freedom in the West, if we lose support for Christianity in the lands that are Christian and post-Christian, mm -hmm. uh, there is nothing left. I mean, that is the last bastion. And I think that we are seeing an accelerated change uh, in the way Christians are referred to, talked about. It's now very common to speak of Christians as bigots mm -hmm. and as people who are are evil because of, for example, an unwillingness to celebrate same-sex marriage. Just to take one example, if we, we have the case of the bakers and the and the different people that have gone to trial and gone into the court, or somebody like Amy Coney Barrett, who's up for U.S. District Court a couple of years ago, right? And and she is is grilled in a very religiously motivated way by Dianne Feinstein and Dick Durbin and the rest on the Senate Judiciary Committee that mm -hmm. are basically saying, well, you know, the dogma lives loudly in you. This is something, if you take your faith that seriously, you might disqualify yourself as someone can hold office or hold a judicial post in this nation because your motives are suspect. You can't be unbiased if you're Christian. In the past, it was assumed that if you were Christian, that was the best key to be sure you were unbiased, that you would really care about justice. Now it's looked upon as if this is some way tainting you and making you unworthy of a place at the table in the Western world. And that that's really scary. Yeah, you, no, you're absolutely right. You know, and the concept of freedom of religion and, and separation of church and state has been perverted, quite frankly. You know, the concept is not it's the, the country was not founded on freedom from religion. Right. Religion has always had a, a, a pride of place in culture and in society. And so this this notion that religion must be relegated to the, the backwaters of your home and your mind and not spoken of publicly. Um, you know, that is a new construct. And and quite frankly, it's an evil one. Um, now, let me ask yeah. you, and you, you, you touched on it. Um, and let's unpack this for a moment. You know, this concept of like, the, the Christian and post Christian West, um, you know, and, and, you know, America being the bastion of religious freedom, given whatever her faults are, and then obviously, you know, she has a troubled history, just like any nation of man. But, you know, she has been a nation that has promoted religious freedom and has probably kept, you know, a lot of persecutions at bay as a result of taking that seriously. So my, my question for you is the nature and pace of persecution today, kind of in this environment, different than at other times in church history? You know, um, obviously, like the Roman persecutions and things that we've seen under Nazi Germany and, and the Soviet Union and whatnot. There have been a lot of bloody episodes in, in church history, but is the pace and persecution of today of a different character? And if so, why and how? Well, it, it, it is. Uh, the numbers themselves, I think it's widely recognized now though, by those who, who, who study and who follow it closely that the number of Christian martyrs and the number of those who live under severe persecution today is the highest in history by far. Um, and even in terms of, of you know, real martyrdoms, people who, who die every year, um, it, it's, really, it's really stunning. There's some 360 to 370 million Christians in the world live under serious persecution. Others where they actually fear for their lives. They fear for their skin. Mm -hmm. This is not just you might lose your job, which is bad enough. It's not just, you know, people aren't going to treat you nice. They're going to ridicule you. This is where you can actually suffer physical violence and death. Um, and that's that's you know, a very, very high number. And the other very important statistic on this is, you know, 75% of those in the world who are persecuted for their faith, whatever their faith might be, but religiously motivated persecution, 75%, three out of four are Christians in the world. And, you know, we all, we hear a lot more about anti-Semitism. We hear a lot about Islamophobia. We hear about these other religious persecutions. We hear about it in the, in the Tibetan uh, case of, of China. But we don't really hear about it so much uh, in terms of Christianity, and yet it is remarkably widespread. 
Yeah, and it's and it's not to um, it's not to uh, disparage the severity or the the impact, you know, to the other faiths, right? I mean, religious intolerance, religious persecution is bad, whatever stripe. But you're right. I think that there is a concerted effort to suppress uh, news about you know Christian persecution. Uh, you know, like I said at, at the start, like it's shocking to me. I mean, we hear some things every now and again, if like something really egregious, the Boko Haram does Christian school girls, Michelle Obama, like gets involved and it kind of bubbles up and becomes a news story. But, you know, that's probably in like an everyday occurrence that that kind of persecution goes on in places like Nigeria. And we just don't ever hear about it because it just doesn't fit the narrative. Yeah. Let me, let me give you a great example of this. This is for me, like the quintessential perfect media blindness uh mm -hmm. or media cover cover up depending on how you know how you want to read it mm -hmm. so in march of 2019 all of us remember that horrific case down in christchurch new zealand where a man went into two different mosques mm -hmm. and started shooting them up he killed 51 muslims mm -hmm. uh he was not well he was later uh killed actually and he uh, but it was everywhere it was on the front page of every major newspaper it led off the news stories and what we didn't, the, the amazing thing was in that exact time frame, there was a two week period, exactly as you say, in, the, in Nigeria, where 220 Christians were killed for their faith in a, in a series of episodes over two weeks. It just day after day, machetes, uh, sh shoot ups, knives, mm -hmm. uh, they, were, they were killed and, and they were killed because they were Christian. This not only did not make front page news, this was not covered by any of the major news outlets print or uh, audiovisual or, or television. It just was not there. It was a non-story, mm -hmm. despite the fact that this was by any standard, journalistic standard, as far as I can tell, that should have been front page just as much as the horrific case in Christchurch, New Zealand, but we never heard about it. Yeah, and I wondered, I, you know, and I, you covered it in the book and I was, I was shocked by it. And I, you know, it occurred to me at the time too, and I'm not sure you may have made the case or made that point, but it's like, there's almost like a racist component to that as well. Um, obviously it's any Christian bias, but almost like, oh, well, that's in Africa, you know, and Africa is a violent place and, you know, terrible things go on there all the time. And, you know, it, almost like the Western media, it's kind of like, well, what do you expect? It's Africa. And they just kind of don't, don't even bother. But it's like, no, hundreds of people were murdered and butchered. And, you know, they were butchered for uh, systemically for, a, you know, for their faith. It wasn't just like a random, you know, say Chicago or something where people are getting killed all the time just because crime is out of control. You know, this is actually, it's, it's a programmatic approach to attacking people because of a certain, you know a certain characteristic in this in this case their christian faith so um now you know talking about persecution active persecution uh let's let's talk about china for a moment um and you know you're there in rome and of course the the vatican in i think 2018 and then they've renewed it you know has had made a, a series of deals brokered by now disgraced you know cardinal theodore mccarrick you know, with the communist authorities in China, um, we don't know what's, you know, we really don't know the details of the deal. Uh, I think it's been kind of insinuated that the reason for that was these deals is this kind of detente with the Chinese authorities. But persecution in China of the, the Catholic Church has actually gotten worse, not better, uh, and because of the deal, quite frankly. I mean, it's really, it's like, it's let the tiger out of the cage, I would say. But can you describe for us a situation in, in countries like China, where you have a state-sanctioned church, you know, church of, of Xi, really, but you have a state-sanctioned church, and then you have an underground church that's loyal to the magisterium. They're loyal, they are trying to be anyway, to, to Rome, and they're trying to be loyal to the one true faith. So you have this this bifurcated situation. Can you unpack for us like what that looks like and and like why that's problematic when our shepherds sell these people up the river? Well, unfortunately, Paul, that is that is exactly what has happened. This is a scandal in the true sense of the term. Uh, and and quite frankly, if we just look at it objectively, this uh, deal itself is probably enough 
to really tar the Francis legacy for history. This is something when people look back, this is going to make, I mean, people worry about, you know, Pius XII, did he say enough, did he not say enough? This is a case mm -hmm. of, of a pope who will not talk about the Uyghur Muslims who are in concentration camps, a million. Uh, he does not defend the underground church at all. And, and as you say, it, it's worse than that. He's actually betrayed them because those who for decades were willing to face torture and punishment and imprisonment and sometimes death to be faithful to Rome, suddenly Rome was saying, it doesn't really matter if you belong to the Patriotic Association, which is state control, which is not loyal to Rome, which never has been. It's only loyal to the Communist Party. It doesn't really make any difference. And, you know, there's no need to have two separate churches. And you prelates and you priests who would like to, you can enlist. And once Rome says that, once it says that you can do this, which has always been, by the way, prohibited, the mm. Vatican is never allowed because it is kind of an anti, it's an anti-church. It is not the church uh, that we believe in and, and adhere to. Um, once you can do that, there's enormous pressure to do that because then the government just says, well, you're just being obstinate because Rome lets you do that now. So if you're not doing it, it's not because you're faithful. It's because you're pigheaded. It's because you're obstinate. You don't want to get with the times. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's a huge feeling of betrayal among uh, those of the underground church in, in uh, China, throughout China. Mm -hmm. And as you say, in the five years intervening since that uh, agreement was first signed in 2018, things have gotten far, far worse than they were. Uh, and this is something it just every other week, there's a new story. The most recent one, this is just two weeks ago, there's a new app put out, APP, by the government, mm. uh, where Christians have to actually, first of all, get the app on their phones, and they have to register every single time they want to go to church. They have to say what church they're going to, what mass they're going to. They need that because they have to show it at the door. Mm -hmm. So this allows the Communist Party to follow if you go to church, how often you go to church, what church you go to. They've already put surveillance equipment inside the churches to know what's being preached to make sure that it doesn't in any way uh, clash with the reigning idea, socialist ideology. It's really a horrific Orwellian situation they're living in. Oh, my gosh. Well, and I... I shouldn't say it, but it's like, I'm sure the FBI is like watching and like, hmm, I wonder how that's working over there. You know, it's, um, it's just, it's amazing to me. And I, I just, I hearken back to that, that image of Cardinal Zen at the Vatican for four days seeking in humility an audience and just like left out, basically left out in the cold, like literally, like they wouldn't let him in. You know, I mean, it, it just, it, it's just, it's mind boggling. Like the, the life of sacrifice that someone like a Cardinal Zen, you know, has shown himself to be a true shepherd of the church and of the faithful and the persecutions that he goes through, um, you know, and they can't be bothered to meet with him yet. Uh, and I don't want to go too far afield here, but they will uh, have no problem, you know, inviting in you know, public heretics who espouse teachings that are wildly uh, at a variance with Catholic dog dogma and have like never been positions never that have been held by the church. They'll they'll bring them in all the time. But a cardinal Zen, they couldn't be bothered with, you know, and it's shame on them. And, and uh, you know, oh, it just uh, I would hate to be I would hate to be somebody who have to go before our Lord and explain that one. So. Um, no, that was that was indeed shameful. I remember, and, and when when Cardinal Zen was finally arrested and tried, mm -hmm. uh, Pope Francis was asked on a, in a plain interview about this, and he said, "Oh yeah," and he basically said, "Yeah, Cardinal Zen, you know, he speaks his mind. Uh, he, he he basically said he got what he was coming to him." Mm -hmm. And and I, and I think also the communists uh, there in Hong Kong, which are now you know, it's, it Beijing is has such influence now in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that they felt. Uh, you know, that there would be no repercussions when they arrested Cardinal Zen. They knew, they knew that, Car that, that the Pope is not going to say anything. And he hasn't, mm -hmm. he is not, he is not. The, the one line out of the Vatican was, yes, we're following, we're following these events with concern. That was it. There was no, you know, this is a violation of religious liberty. What do you, what do you think you're doing? All he was, was, you know, supportive legally of uh, the pro-democracy marches and 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 uh, demonstrations in in Hong Kong. No, it's really shameful, 
shameful our willingness to throw, as you say, such a hero of the faith under the bus like that. So coming back to the West and, um, you know, and I, it's also a kind of remarkable to me, you know, I'm a, and I've, I've told other guests this, I'm a child of, I'm a Novus Ordo child. I I mm -hmm. have been an attendee of the Novus Ordo mass my whole life. I've recently in the last year or two started attending the traditional Latin mass, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. One is, you know, like during COVID, they were, you know, they really came back together very quickly um, didn't like allow these kind of phony shutdowns to, um, impede, you know, the celebration of the sacraments. And then of course, as I started to learn more, um, I learned, you know, about the, the, the theology behind the liturgy of the, the traditional Latin mass. It's focused on our Eucharistic Lord and the sacrifice therein. And, you know, so I see the beauty of the mass of the ages, right. Um, uh, but at the same time, I love my Novus Ordo brothers and sisters, and that's the faith tradition I've come from. So I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a ramrod like, oh, you know, you, right. you post Vatican II people are all, you know, just knuckleheads, nothing like that. But it's remarkable to me because now we're starting to see, or at least here in the United States, um, we're really seeing a, like a concerted effort to suppress the Latin Mass more and more. Um, Cardinal Roche has said a number of things, really just kind of hammering down on it. Clearly with the uh, the blessing of the Pope, you know, they're really trying to squash the Latin mass. And um, which to me is kind of strange because it's like, it's never seemed to be a problem, at least in my life, you know? Uh, and, and I wasn't, I was but a babe when Paul VI squashed it. But it it seems to be to me the reason I bring this up a road toward persecution of the church here in the West of the of driving the faithful those who want to really be faithful to the teachings of Catholicism into the catacombs and that we may very well very soon see the ape of the church that Bishop Fulton Sheen talked about kind of foisted upon us with like the synod and synodality and the shenanigans going on in Germany and all that kind of business. So my question, apologies for the long soapbox preamble. Mm -hmm. Do you see persecution accelerating here in the West? And what examples from what do you, what examples from history and other parts of the world teach us about what we can do to be ready to weather the storm? That's that's a fantastic question. I'm sure it's on a lot of your viewers and listeners' minds. Uh, you know, I I I keep coming back to what St. Paul wrote about in, in, in 2 Corinthians, where he's he, he's going through kind of the litany of his sufferings and the dangers and perils that he faces on a daily basis. And he talks about how many times he was beaten with sticks, how many times he was shipwrecked, how many times. And he goes and talks about perils from brigands, and he says, and perils from false brethren. You know, one of the things that he lists as being a suffering and a source of persecution in his own life, in his own ministry, was that of false brethren. And uh and we do, you know, suffer at the hands of the church as well as we do, you know, by just simply being members of the church. And I think that that, unfortunately, is also to be expected. I don't think it's something that should make us lose faith in the church. I don't think it should make us schismatics or running off to go, you know, who knows where to do who knows what. We have to stay, you know, on the bark of Peter. This is this is where we are. And this is where we're meant to be. But it is real suffering, and it's real suffering, especially when our leadership uh, does not live up to their high calling and actually participates more in, in, in the pain and the sorrow of believers than in emboldening and encouraging and confirming them in the faith. And that is something that, you know, we, I, I think, are called to suffer uh, together um, without, you know, overly being overly rebellious in the sense that we should acknowledge it, we should point it out, we should know that it's real, and we should not sugarcoat anything. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we want all of our brothers and sisters to stay true uh, to the church that Jesus Christ founded. And, you know, sometimes it goes through a really rough patch, and, and uh, it seems that the helmsman is asleep because the one, you know, who is visible there is, is asleep uh, or worse. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as, as Peter said to Jesus, you know, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where are we going to run to? There, there really is no other option. If we look at history, the way that people in times of, of trouble in the church 
Uh, you know, we often look back, for example, just to take one obvious example of the Protestant Reformation. You know, we often say, oh, that bad Luther and the bad Zwingli and these bad, you know, people who are, well, there was a lot of bad things happening in the church and there was a, a crying need for reform. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't that kind of reform. It wasn't the reform of rebellion. The kind of reform that was needed was a reform in holiness. It was a reform in getting the church back strong on track. The way not to do that is by splitting off. The way to do that is by holding on and strengthening our brethren and also by living lives of heroic holiness ourselves. And I think that that's what we need to remember. That's one of the greatest lessons from history is, you know, don't get off the ship. Just, you know, shore it up and and pray and and saints will come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm reading the book of Ezekiel right now. Um, just it was in, put on my heart to read it. And it's fascinating to me because... As I understand it, Ezekiel, you know, is the first prophet to write uh, outside or to prophesy outside of Israel, right? He was part of the mm -hmm. Babylon captivity. And so you have this you have this scenario where the Jews had really grown complacent and and quite frankly, presumptuous of God, because we have Jerusalem, we have the temple, you know, we will always have God. And so then they fell into idolatry and uh lewdness and all, all manner of of bad behavior and so god used nebuchadnezzar as a, a foil and an instrument to to bring his people back and they were driven out of jerusalem which must have been a terrible mind blow to them you know how, how could this happen we have the temple you know we have god you know has god abandoned us and so ezekiel was sent to them to say no god has not abandoned you now you know but the nature of like remaining true to God has has changed that you can't just presume because you're in Jerusalem with the temple that you can get away with whatever you want. And so yeah. I almost it seems prophetic for how we are today that just because we have the Catholic faith, right, we have the faith of the ages doesn't mean that everything that we know about Catholicism, you know, we there's there's obedience to man. But there's a higher obedience owed to God, right? Sure. And you know, so, so it's just being mindful of that. So schism is not, and I've said this before, schism is not necessarily disagreeing. It's not disagreeing with the Vatican. It's disagreeing with God, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just having a proper ordering of like where our allegiance and obedience uh, belongs to. Now, now picking that up, let me ask you, uh, let's talk about the Abrahamic house of worship. Which is a very fascinating thing to me. And I think like on a human level, you know, it's like on the face of it, it seems like, you know, I mean, brotherhood of man and people getting along and we're all praying together. And I mean, there there seems to be in a natural order of things, a positive there. But theologically, it's this very problematic really for all three religions, I think. But, um, you know, so for those who aren't paying attention, you know, we have this Abrahamic house of worship. It recently opened. It features a church, a mosque, and a synagogue, right? But so Christ teaches us that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. So it's, he's not just the preferred way. He's the only way. And then, you know, and in your book, you, you explain that like a leading cause of persecution of Christians is in Islamic countries is the incompatibility of Islam with other faiths due to Sharia law and jihad. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you actually make the point that the jihadists could, it could be argued are like the most, are fulfilling the most, uh, faithfully the dictates of the Quran, right? You know, so it's like they're trying to be faithful to their to their faith. Christ is telling us he's the, the the way, the truth, the life, you know, and then in Judaism, there is the tribe and then there's the rest of the world and the rest of the world is outside the nation of, of, of Israel, right? So it's like all of these faiths have in, in, in their own, their own unique charisms, I should say, uh, an incompatibility with other faiths, I would say. So yeah. what positive impact do you think, if any, something like this facility has on decreasing the persecution of Christians? You know, and, and then my last point is, 
in many of these societies where persecution is already happening, Christians are already living, working, you know, among their persecutors, and it doesn't seem to soften persecution at all. So how is something like this, I guess, can you help us kind of unpack the Abrahamic house of worship and what are we to make of all that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with your analysis, Paul. I, I think that, unfortunately, this sort of thing, whereas it may very well be done with goodwill, with the intent of, of getting along better, uh, that doesn't really seem to be the case at all. In fact, I'll give you an, another example because you're kind of you kind of brought it up with the question of jihad and who's really the true faithful Muslim. Mm. Uh, I remember very well in 2016 with the Islamic State where they got very very upset with Pope Francis because Pope Francis in a couple uh, different homilies and a general alliance tried to minimize the religious aspect of the jihad that they were practicing and said, no, this is not about religion. This is not a religious battle at all. This is about economic questions. It's about East-West. It's about, and he did everything in his power to minimize the religious aspect. And they got so upset that they dedicated an entire issue of Dabiq, which was their kind of propaganda magazine, the Islamic State, to answering Pope Francis saying, look, this is a religious war. Our motivation is 100% religious. That's the only reason we're doing it because it's the will of Allah. Don't you dare take that away from us and make it sound like it's some socioeconomic pressure that's moving us. The reason we're doing this is because it's God's will. Mm -hmm. This is a religious question, right? And, and that is at the forefront. And I think that the, the, the problem with something like the Abrahamic house is that the natural consequence is a watering down of dif differences and a wandering down of the religious identity of anyone who participates in it, because you're going to want to say, oh yeah, well that's, well that's just like us. Oh, that's just like us. That, you know what? It's not. It's not just like us. And and we do believe that Jesus is the sole, unique, and universal Savior of mankind. We do. And Muslims do not accept that. That's fine. We agree to disagree. You know what? We can live together in a pluralistic society with a certain form of healthy secularism. Take, for example, the United States and its better moments, right, where we respect out of respect for the dignity of the person, out of respect for religious freedom for all. We can say that, yes, yes, we can coexist on really friendly terms, on good terms, mm. but we don't need to bring that into a house of worship where we're saying, like, how is this going to look when our worship is so different? The mass, you brought up the mass earlier. The mass is the quintessential form of Catholic worship. This is Jesus's sacrifice on Calvary. What does that have in common with any other form of worship of these of these other religions? It doesn't. And this is not something, you know, it, it, it's not ill will. It's not hostility toward them. It's simply recognizing who we are, what we have. And also the fact that we're called to testify to the entire world and make disi disciples of all the nations, which is, again, something Pope Francis, unfortunately, has really sought to undermine. He talks about, no, don't try to convert anybody. Don't. This is not who we are. Um, and that's just wrong. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, tell it to his Jesuit forebears who like gave yeah. their life, you know, in Asia and Latin America and elsewhere, you know, so, um, so you, you mentioned watering it down and I'm, I'm seeing in my mind it playing out, you know, people go to visit this house, you know, I don't know how regularly you can go if you're not like a local, but you know, it's like, eh, Let's go see what the, you know, what's going on in the synagogue this week. Why would I, you know, check out mass next week? And, you know, I mean, it's like you start kind of mixing and matching, you know, like it, it, if anything, it's like it, it, like you said, waters down the faith to where it's. And I, I suspect that's what we're really seeing is this like Masonic, almost this idea of the, the brotherhood of man. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, to tell if, if, or fratelli tutti. Yeah. yeah and it's you know liberty equality and fraternity it's like oh the dictates of the french revolution that's you know <laughs> something you wouldn't normally think to see in a papal encyclical but okay there it is um so my last question for you kind of coming up hitting on this idea of watering down is the church failing to prepare her martyrs for the road ahead well, I think the unfortunate answer to that question is yes. I, I think, I mean, speaking about the church, obviously, it's a, it's a broad reality. I think there are 
very holy priests and nuns and lay people, and there are very holy parishes where people are very well prepared because you have a very zealous local pastor or priest or spiritual director, or whatever it may be. But I think on the whole, I think Christians are very ill prepared for what is coming. I, I think that we're not used to thinking in terms of being ready for martyrdom. We're, we, we're not used to thinking in terms of, you know, picking up your cross every day and following Jesus. Even though it's so central to the gospel message, it's so easy to just, you know, again, sugarcoat that, to go around it, to, to focus on other passages, on other topics. And, and again, if all you're going to talk about is the brotherhood of man and climate change and immigrants, and, and then you're not, not going to be preparing your people for the spiritual warfare that is part and parcel of the Christian life. And it is, you know, what we're here on earth for, uh, mm -hmm. to stay true to our Lord, to bear witness to him, to all the nations, um, and to, you know, be ready for whatever will come, knowing that the Holy Spirit will strengthen us and give us wisdom at the moment we need to, we need to say our peace. Um, that's where we need to be. And that's what we need to be prepared for. But I don't see a lot of that happening, unfortunately. Mm. No, it's, I think it's, it, comes down to a question of supernatural faith. Are you going to follow God or are you going to follow man? You know, is it a church of God or is it a church of man? And, you know, as, as the Catholic church just become another NGO, you know, dictated by the UN and, you know, and it, it does some nice things. I mean, nobody gives their lives for an organization that does some nice things, you know? Yeah. Or, yeah so, uh, and Christian persecution is coming, whether we like it or not, it's already here at our doorstep um and regrettably maybe not regrettably because the, by the you know salvation hopefully will come to many um uh, but you know we will be chastised and uh you know then hopefully people will turn back to the faith before it's too late so thomas williams the coming christian persecution from our friends at sophia institute uh, thank you so much this is a great book i uh, highly recommend it a lot of uh, really interesting um historical anecdotes as well as like uh you know research into what's going on around the world now and what we should be prepared for so thank you so much for being on our show today to talk with us about it thank you so much paul this was very enlightening for me as well and it's always a pleasure thank you